Constructed as a seemingly natural progression to the ocean liner, the Bristol Type 167 Brabazon was one of the largest passenger airliners ever to fly, being approximately the size of a modern Boeing 767 and would have encapsulated the very essence of post-war luxury air travel by providing sleeping accommodation, an a la carte restaurant, an onboard cinema and a promenade deck, all for the consumption and comfort of the discerning affluent traveller. Sadly, even by the time of its first flight in September 1949, the Brabazon's proposition to the airliner industry was already far obsolete, as despite its huge size, the machine was tailored to only carry 100 passengers, representing an abysmal cost-per-passenger-mile ratio during a period when airlines desired increasing amounts of seating to offset operational expenses. While at the same time its sheer dimensions also served to be its downfall, thus leading to one of the mightiest British airliners ever built being scrapped without ever having carried a fair paying passenger. The origins of the Bristol Brabazon lay during the middle of the Second World War, where by 1942, Britain's aircraft industry had been almost entirely devoted to fighters and bombers, while civil transport aircraft were being brought in from the United States, whose manufacturers had been able to maintain a far broader portfolio even while at war, with ministers and senior planners recognising that when peace returned, this reliance would leave the country dangerously exposed. Britain might have been a wartime leader in aeronautical engineering, having produced aircraft of exceptional quality and performance, but it risked starting the post-war era with no modern civil airliners and a home industry ill-prepared to compete with powerful American manufacturers who, unlike their British counterparts, have maintained civil production and were already poised to dominate the lucrative global passenger market. This looming disadvantage was not merely a matter of commercial pride, as civil aviation was expected to play a vital role in binding together the far-flung parts of the British Empire and in maintaining the transatlantic ties with the United States that the war had strengthened, and without a strong civil aviation industry, Britain might have found itself not only losing revenue, but also slipping in political influence and prestige. To address this, the government convened in 1943 what became known as the Brabazon Committee, chaired by Lord Brabazon of Tara a celebrated aviator and a persuasive advocate for bold thinking, with its remit being to forecast the likely needs of post-war civil aviation across Britain and the Empire, and to recommend designs that would allow the country to re-enter the world market with confidence and in a style that would command international respect. The committee worked from a simple but far-reaching premise that air travel after the war would expand rapidly and that Britain's imperial and transatlantic connections would require aircraft of scale and comfort never before attempted with the only benchmarks for long-distance travel during this period being the great ocean liners that had carried generations of travellers across the Atlantic, and it was assumed that the same wealthy clientele who booked first-class berths on the Atlantic run would expect similar luxury in the air. Speed was certainly desirable, but for these anticipated passengers, comfort, reliability and the aura of prestige were paramount, and the aircraft envisaged would not simply transport people, but would embody the nation's ability to deliver modern luxury and technological sophistication, and among the several types of aircraft the committee specified, the most ambitious was the so-called Type 1, a very large transatlantic airliner able to cross from Britain to the United States in one leg while offering the sort of space and facilities associated with a liner at sea. The vision was of an ocean liner of the skies, an aircraft with wide cabins, lounges, perhaps even a cinema, and seating density far below that of a conventional airliner, with passengers being able to dine, converse and even sleep in comfort as they crossed the Atlantic, almost forgetting that they were in the air at all, while it would also be an unmistakable symbol of British technological prowess and a reassurance that the nation could match and ideally outshine American advances. The Bristol Aircraft Company was particularly well-placed to respond to the ambitious call for a post-war transatlantic airliner, with the company's design team having already accumulated years of experience with large aeroplanes long before the Second World War had even begun, with 1937 having seen the company's designers examine giant bomber concepts at a time when few others were contemplating aircraft of such scale, and by 1942 they had revisited these studies in response to an air ministry requirement for a 100-ton bomber. Their calculations on size, range and payload, including the need for powerful engines and very long wings, coincided neatly with the civil demands the Brabazon Committee would set out a year later, and this work meant that when the committee invited proposals for its Type 1 airliner, the firm adapted its long-range bomber studies into a civil design and found that the performance figures already envisaged 5,000 miles of range and the capacity to carry about 100 passengers in comfort which were exactly those the government now sought, with Bristol's prior exploration of high-weight airframes, fuel capacity and aerodynamic efficiency giving it a head start, 
and the company's engineers were able to move swiftly from military concepts to a civilian project of unprecedented ambition. Led by the gifted aerodynamicist L.G. Freeze and the forward-thinking designer Archibald Russell, the Bristol team took the outlines of their giant bomber studies and carefully adapted them for civilian needs, and in 1944 they submitted what would become known as the Type 167, a design that aimed not merely to satisfy the committee's demands, but to set new standards for comfort and engineering sophistication. The Air Ministry, convinced that the project represented the future of British long-range air transport, issued Specification 244 and authorised the construction of two prototypes, and from the very outset, the Type 167, known as the Bristol Brabazon, promised to be an aircraft of unprecedented scale and ambition, with a vast 230-foot wingspan that, within the broad structure of the wings, were cavernous fuel tanks able to store the enormous quantities of fuel required for regular non-stop Atlantic crossings. The fuselage itself was a triumph of bold thinking, with a circular section 25 feet in diameter, which was significantly wider than even the Boeing 747 of the 1970s, and was planned to contain two complete decks running the length of the cabin, as rather than the tightly packed rows of seats familiar to later generations of travellers, the Brabazon was conceived to have a series of luxurious lounges, sleeping berths and even a cinema, all designed to provide passengers with a level of comfort and spaciousness far beyond the expectations of contemporary commercial aviation. Propulsion presented both a formidable challenge and an enticing opportunity for innovation, with Bristol choosing to rely on its own most powerful piston engine, the 18-cylinder Centaurus, a sleeve valve radial capable of a prodigious output, with eight of these mighty engines being grouped in pairs within the wings, with each pair driving a common gearbox, which subsequently turned culture-rotating propellers. The potential rewards were considerable, with this system promising smooth and efficient thrust, minimizing vibration, and delivering the sustained power necessary for the long and demanding Atlantic routes. And to ensure that such a massive airplane could be handled safely and with the finesse expected of a civil airliner, Bristol equipped it with a suite of technical innovations that placed it at the cutting edge of aeronautical practice. The Brabazon became the first aircraft to feature fully powered flying controls throughout, and it incorporated electric engine management and high pressure hydraulics at a time when these ideas were still new, while a gust alleviation system, activated by a probe mounted on the nose, automatically adjusted the control surfaces to compensate for turbulence, a further refinement aimed at ensuring passenger comfort. The company pursued weight saving with equal determination, with engineers varying the thickness of the metal skin panel by panel, using stronger gauges only where the loads demanded it, and they refined the method of riveting so that every joint was both secure and as light as possible, while new machining techniques were pioneered to allow the accurate production of very large structural components, many of which had to be drilled, milled and rolled to tolerances never before attempted in Britain. The sheer physical scale of the project soon raised awkward and costly practical questions, with Bristol's existing facilities at Filton being far too small to cope with the construction of what was, by the standards of the mid-1940s, one of the largest aeroplanes in the world, with the airfield's modest 2,000-foot runway being patently inadequate for such a giant. The solution demanded an ambitious expansion program, with a vast new assembly hall, at the time the largest in the world, being designed under the direction of TPO Sullivan. While alongside this architectural feat, the runway was lengthened to an impressive 8,000 feet, long enough to accommodate the Brabazon's takeoff requirements. Though this expansion was not without controversy, for it required the compulsory removal of the nearby village of Charlton, an act that drew local protest, but which the government regarded as essential to the future of the British aviation industry. Even while these vast works were underway, Bristol continued to meet its wartime production commitments, balancing military obligations with the needs of the ambitious civil project, and to aid the design process, the company constructed a full-scale wooden mock-up of the aircraft within the old No. 2 flight shed, allowing engineers and fitters to test fittings and systems in life-size before committing them to the expensive metal structure, and only in the closing months of 1945 did work begin on the first prototype's fuselage within the newly enlarged Filton site. As the Brabazon gradually took shape, the aeronautical world was beginning to explore the possibilities of the emerging turboprop engine, a technology that promised to combine the speed of jet propulsion with the fuel efficiency of the piston engine, and Bristol's own Proteus engine seemed to offer greater power and significantly less vibration than the Centaurus, qualities that would enhance passenger comfort and reduce maintenance. 
By 1946, the decision had been taken to fit the second prototype with these new engines, creating what was designated the Brabazon Mark II, with the projected performance gains including a higher cruising speed, an improved service ceiling, and a notable reduction in empty weight, all of which would make the aircraft more competitive on the demanding North Atlantic route, though in practice, the Proteus would prove troublesome, beset by early problems of weight, power output, and fatigue, and the promise of an early advance was to be delayed. Nevertheless, the buzz surrounding the Brabazon remained considerable, with its many upcoming facets being widely publicized, including enclosed sleeping berths for up to 80 passengers, a dining room, a 37-seat cinema, a promenade and bar, or alternatively, day seats for 150 people, with the interior layout including six forward compartments, the midsection with 38 seats arranged around tables together with a pantry and galley, and the day seating and aft-facing cinema at the rear. In December 1948, the sole prototype of the Bristol Brabazon was finally rolled out of the cavernous assembly hall, but as the first trials approached, the Bristol engineers were well aware that they were dealing with an aircraft far larger than anything previously built in Britain, and so every system was checked and double-checked, while the ground crews listened intently as the engines roared into life, and flight engineers monitored the complicated gearboxes and propeller assemblies. It was during these initial runs that one of the smaller but significant difficulties emerged, with the nose wheel steering system, crucial for guiding the huge aircraft along the runway, proving erratic, and though this defect was not catastrophic, it was serious enough that the decision was taken to disable the system temporarily, relying instead on differential engine power for ground manoeuvring. By early September 1949, the long-awaited moment had come and the aircraft was finally prepared for flight, with September 3rd seeing Bristol's chief test pilot, Bill Pegg, climb into the cockpit to put the machine through a series of high-speed taxi trials, and apart from the previously identified steering quirk, which the crew had already learned to compensate for, the Brabazon behaved flawlessly during these tests. The following day on September 4, 1949, with thousands of onlookers gathered along the airfield perimeter, the Brabazon began its maiden flight, with the aircraft lifting itself cleanly into the skies above Bristol for the first time, while once airborne, Peg kept the airplane at a steady 160 miles an hour and climbed to around 3,000 feet, high enough to demonstrate its stability without venturing too far from the safety of Filton. The aircraft's behavior was steady and dignified, its huge control surfaces responding smoothly to the powered flying controls, and for 25 minutes the Brabazon carved an elegant path through the clouds, with an estimated 10,000 spectators having gathered to see the event, while the press, eager for grand declarations, dubbed it the Queen of the Skies, and emphasized that it was the largest land plane yet constructed. The timing of this maiden flight was deliberate, as only four days later the Brabazon made its first public appearance at the Society of British Aircraft Constructors Air Show at Farnborough, where the aircraft performed a majestic fly past, while in June 1950, the Brabazon paid a visit to London Heathrow, and several successful takeoffs and landings were carried out, proving that the airplane was more than capable of operating from the country's principal airport, while that summer it once again returned to Farnborough for display and fly past. Yet by the time the prototype had finally lifted off from Filton in September 1949, the optimistic assumptions that had nourished the project for nearly a decade were already beginning to crumble, as what had seemed in the early 1940s to be a natural and even inevitable step for a nation determined to resume its pre-war status as a world leader in air transport was, by 1949, starting to look more like a grand gesture than a sound commercial proposition. The Brabazon emerged from a world still shaped by wartime experiences, where government committees and industry experts believed that post-war air travel would continue to be the preserve of the wealthy few, imagining that those who could afford the luxury of crossing the Atlantic by air would be willing to pay handsomely for the sort of accommodation and entertainment that only an ocean liner might provide, and that the prestige of a British-built flagship would help sustain the country's reputation as an imperial and technological power. However, by the time the great machine actually took to the skies, these assumptions belonged to a vanishing age, with the most fundamental difficulty lying in the rapid and, to many planners, unexpected change in the commercial market for long-haul travel, with the United States, which already enjoyed a far larger civil aviation network than Britain, seeing airplanes fill their cabins with paying tourists who wanted simple and affordable seats rather than lounges and promenade decks. Their focus was increasingly on speed, economy and reliability, rather than on lavish luxury, and the Brabazon's cavernous double-deck fuselage provided unprecedented space and a degree of comfort that no rival could match, but with only around 100 seats it carried too few passengers to compete in terms of revenue, with the cost per passenger mile being inevitably far higher than that of a new generation of American types, such as the Lockheed Constellation and the Douglas DC-6, 
both of which combine modern performance with a more practical balance of comfort and economy. The state-owned national airline, BOAC, which had been consulted at every stage of the design, grew markedly cooler once it experienced the prototype's ponderous performance at first hand, with senior executives judging it underpowered and slow to respond to the controls, and they saw little commercial merit in an airplane that would be costly to buy, complex and expensive to maintain, and ultimately uneconomic to operate in the fiercely competitive transatlantic market that was beginning to take shape. The very qualities that made the Brabazon a technical marvel contributed to the difficulties that beset it, and while the planned Mark II version with paired Proteus turboprops and a faster cruise speed promised to overcome the original's lack of power and might have offered a more commercially attractive machine, no airline orders were forthcoming, and the government eventually lost patience with an aircraft for which no paying customer could be found. By the early 1950s, Britain's domestic situation added further pressures, with the economy remaining under rationing and the political climate having shifted from wartime ambition to post-war austerity, and with £6 million having already been spent on the Brabazon and further millions needed to complete the Mark II, these figures became increasingly hard to defend at a time when the country was struggling to rebuild its infrastructure and meet the social expectations of a population weary of privation. In July 1953, despite fleeting interest from British European Airways as to employing the sole Brabazon as a high-capacity airliner for the London to Paris run, the Minister of Supply, Duncan Sands, announced in the House of Commons that the programme would be terminated, acknowledging that it had yielded valuable technical knowledge, but pointed out that neither civil airlines nor the military wished to place orders for the type. After 164 flights and a total of only 382 hours in the air, the sole prototype was formally withdrawn from service. In October of the same year, it was broken up for scrap, along with the incomplete second airframe that would have formed the basis of the turboprop version, while the giant hangar and lengthened runway at Filton, built at such expense to accommodate the Leviathan, were left as its most tangible monuments, silent witnesses to a dream cut short. Yet the Brabazon's influence extended far beyond its brief flying life, with the infrastructure created for the project giving Bristol a foundation for later successes, with the same runway and assembly hall soon being used to build the Britannia airliner and, a generation later, to participate in the construction of the Anglo-French Concorde, while many of the techniques first mastered for the Brabazon, with precision machining of large airframe components, the sealing of rivets to reduce drag, the design of powered controls and the development of reliable high-pressure hydraulic systems, becoming standard practice in the construction of large aircraft. Ultimately, although the Brabazon failed as a commercial venture and became an emblem of ambitious but impractical planning, it served as a crucible for ideas and skills that shaped Britain's later achievements in civil aviation, and what had once seemed an extravagant white elephant proved instead to be a quietly influential chapter in the history of flight, and whose apparent failure helped to lay the groundwork for some of the most celebrated aircraft of the late 20th century.